Hello. Welcome to another episode of Season 16 of The Horrific Podcast. We're two friends who live in different places but share a love for scary movies. In each episode, we both watch the same movie on our own and then record a conversation together about what we liked, what we hated, if we were scared, and maybe even some larger truths about why people watch horror movies in the first place. This season, the theme is B-Movies for C-Students. We're taking a break from the current trends toward elevated horror and examining the history of horror B-Movies and how they've developed over time. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the episode. So we're moving right along here through season 16. We're already on our second movie review. Last week we did The Mask of Fu Manchu from 1932, and this week we're doing Dr. X from 1932, as we make our way through B-horror movies from different decades. Did you know anything at all about this movie before we picked it? Hmm. No, I knew nothing. I just liked the name. Same. I, and yeah. it has really good like movie poster art. So it just had kind of that misty shirt up. Yeah. And it's also come up on a lot of lists that I've seen in the past for like when we've done, you know, horror hundred years of horror or, you know, old horror movies and stuff, but I didn't know anything about it other than that. Fay Ray was in it. And I feel like that was fitting because last week we had Boris Karloff in a B movie mm-hmm. who had been in Frankenstein. And this week we've got Fay Ray in a B horror movie who was in King Kong the next year. So really checking the boxes for early thirties horror stardom. I also think that we're probably like one of the few podcasts out there that like, we'll just straight up admit like, no, we just like the name and picture art. That's why we picked it. Yeah. No like there's, there wasn't much science behind it. I mean, it was on, you know, we knew it was it, the film was B, but still straight up. That's why, I, that's why I like yeah. it. Well, I just, I feel like for there to be science, we would have to want something like we should, we would have yeah. to be like trying to do something. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you something. The only thing I want out of this podcast, good conversation with good friend. And I get that right. every week. No science about it. Damn straight. So this one was still in the era of B movies being shot on Hollywood lots. So they were low budget, but they still had access to whatever was lying around. Also had studio people kind of calling the shots. So we're not yet in the era of completely rogue filmmaking. But this, you know, just like last week, was also one of the last movies to be made before the Hayes Code. Mm -hmm. So it's still technically pre-code, and that's how they got away with talking about murder and cannibalism and so on in 1932. Two years later. Yeah. It it was implemented. So, yeah. Yeah. But I think this it also had a lot of things that we talked about with 90s horror movies. Like, they all had that annoying wise guy character that tried Mm -hmm. too hard but wasn't funny. Mm -hmm. And Lee Tracy was damn near insufferable in this one. Yeah. I mean, it it just made me cringe. Yeah. It was was one of the more confusing pieces of this film, if I'm being honest. Like, or frustrating pieces of the film. Agreed. There's just, like, you didn't need, like, if you didn't have that, like, this would be straight up a decent film we got but or at least in my opinion but um it's just like well, it's unnecessary he was definitely my least favorite part of it and that kind of dragged things down mm-hmm. and i think that that was almost like it felt like this one was trying to cast a really wide net it's like all right if you want something that's really like spine tingling horror we've got it but we're also going to throw in some comedy you're going to have old Lee just out there mm-hmm. making funny faces and falling down. And then there's going to be mystery and there's going to be murder. And, you know, kind of like we talked about last week with the mask of Fu Manchu, they're just like throwing you right in it. And it's like, all right, mystery, adventure, race against time, you know, all this stuff going on. I feel like this one was kind of trying to go for that in a way of let's hit a bunch of different sort of movie genres mm-hmm. and pack them into one. And, you know, cast as wide a net as possible to try and keep as many people entertained as possible. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that it, um, if honestly, like I was while well, watching this one, I was kind of thinking with like the evil dead, like how they had some, you know, humor with it, except for it was just executed better. And I, 
I think that was like part of the struggle as well. Cause it was like, well, okay. It does technically kind of check the box with like unprecedented humor when it's not necessarily needed. However, yeah. you know, it's there. What can you, you know, what can you do about it? But it just wasn't executed very well. And, um, it was almost like watching like the three stooges be in like a horror movie in a way, or like Bugs Bunny, <laughs> like being, in a horror castle or whatever that first one was. But, um, yeah, that actually is a very, very yeah. accurate <laughs> yeah. comparison, which, you know, I mean, maybe up until, I don't, you know, I don't know, maybe, you know, they're, they're still trying to figure it all out, but, but still it was, it was like, that was a thing you have to hurdle over while watching this just as a warning to our listeners, you know? And it was just so, off from the whole tone yeah. and everything about the rest of the movie. And they would move his character from being kind of the goofy, funny guy into being like romantic interest slash sort of hero hero. Yeah. And so you never really knew which role to think of him in, in any given scene, which I think hurt it. And, you know, they gave him a catchphrase where he would just snap and say bad luck as if that was a thing that was going to catch on. Like there just, <laughs> there were so many choices about his character that I thought were abysmal. But if you can take that out, I, <laughs> I would say uh, Lee Tracy was the racism in this movie. If we're comparing <laughs> it to <laughs> Mask of Fu Manchu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I could, I mean, yeah, it's just like, hey, if you just gloss over this piece of it, yeah. it's a really fine movie. Just forget yeah. about this problem. Um, I think for me, it was more so like by the end, I was just like eye roll about it. Yeah. Like I, I didn't it, it didn't bother me as much because you are like you know you do think like okay, well this is the '30s, you know this was like one of the early ad- adopters of like Technicolor and and. Um, and all of that. So like there were like big things that were happening with his film It just so happened. You had this weird kind of douche guy that was like kind of like the butt of the joke. Like he was the really ugly daughter. He (laughs) should have been called the really ugly daughter (laughs) and insignificant. Yeah. 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 Feels like they took a big swing and missed. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Working our way around that, there is still lots of interesting stuff to talk about with this one. Like, I feel like we saw some more Frankenstein influence in this one, too. And just kind of like the scientist with experimental electrical equipment and, you know, setting it up on a dark and stormy night where you've got this, uh, you know, sort of this this giant equipment and the people that are there and you don't really know what's going on or what's going to come out of it. And then you have the scene where, not to give too much away, Wells was also like a mad scientist. And there's a scene where he's turning himself into a monster. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of be like, it's an, it's a mad scientist with using electricity to create a monster, even though it's him turning himself into the monster. So I I think you could say this one took a lot of inspiration, if not a straight copying from Frankenstein, but again, can't emphasize enough how influential Frankenstein had to be at this point, just because of how much money it made off of so low a budget. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. I think my favorite thing about the film though, was like, was that trans Atlantic, um, monologue that are like how they talked. Yeah. The like accent. Everyone, like, you see, yeah, yeah. It's just like, Oh, this is crazy. Like this is one of them. Like that I'm sure that has been on lists of like, if you want to hear what that accent sounded like, watch, watch this film. Cause it was like 90% of them. And I was there for it. I was yeah. here for it. I was just like, all right, let's do it. It felt fitting. It did. Enough. It really did, yeah. actually. Yeah. 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 Well, cool. Uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction, and then we can get into the synthetic flesh, synthetic flesh details. In 1932, Warner Brothers brought us Dr. X, a mystery horror film starring Lionel Atwill and Fay Ray. This movie tells the story of the enigmatic head of a medical academy named Dr. Xavier, who is in a race against time to catch a medically minded killer before the police launch their own investigation and bring shame on the school's reputation. As the bodies pile up, the mystery only gets deeper and Dr. X gets more desperate. 
This film was made on a budget of $224,000, and I couldn't find out how much it made at the box office, but it does have a certifiably badass movie poster. It can currently be rented for streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Perfect. So I do want to talk about a couple of things that would normally be facts. So they're technically facts here. Nice. I'm into it. Like I was kind of saying earlier, uh, this is, you know, uh, early Technicolor uh, film. Um, so it this was, was weird. Th- yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so this was one of the first films to be shot in two color Technicolor, um, which I was saying last week with with the special effects of like maybe it was easier because it was it was black and white. So like, I mm-hmm. don't think they knew what they were getting themselves into with the special effects, but like yeah. that explains why like the color of the film was like a little janky at all times, but to give them, you know, credit where credit's due, like it's, it's definitely helps with the evolution of like, you know, certain like film techniques and all that. So like, that's, it's pretty cool to to watch, I guess, uh, just from that fact alone, like being an early adopter. But it was hard to watch at times, but it was still pretty cool to see. Um, this is also based on a play. It's loosely based on a play, The Terror, by Howard W. Comstock and Alan C. Miller. Um, the play was just basically the, or the basic premise of it. Um, there were significant changes as, as per usual. Um, their special effects with this was also, I guess you would call a little groundbreaking. I do kind of want to get into that towards the end of the film a little, or end of the episode. Um, and then how it kind of ties in, I feel like with B, B horror movies, like it's kind of like a combo genre, you know, it's horror, it's thriller in, in some sorts. Um, and just the fact that <laughs> the plot revolves around a series of cannibalistic murders and a mad scientist, right? which is like technically, um, yeah. So it's, it, it just, there we go. It's campy because it's it, the set. It had, I assume, you know, with the, you know, like the other B movies we talked about, um, you know, limited budget, you kind of got to do what you can, which I think it does help that it, it seemed like it was raining the whole time uh, during this film. Definitely wasn't, but it felt like it. And it's like, oh, well, that can kind of help you make everyone just be inside where you can have like a play, um, like a set from a play uh, in, a, in a way. So um, I don't know if that was done on purpose, but it was just like, oh, this is a smart way to do it. It definitely makes you feel campy, like a campy horror film in, of sorts, or at least it did myself. But the last thing I actually have was one of the things I thought was kind of interesting, like I was saying earlier, was uh, with, with the Technicolor and how it was one of the early adopters. However, like there were obviously the technical limitations of like the color process, which required like super bright lighting, um, you know, attention to and very careful attention to the color design. Additionally, the film was shot simultaneously, both in Technicolor and black and white versions. Um, Black and white was intended for international markets and smaller U S markets that didn't have Technicolor projection capabilities yet. So I didn't even like, I, I guess I think like, Oh, well, this is cool. It's Technicolor. It's, you know, like they're trying something new, but then you think like, yeah, they're going through limitations in filming itself, but what about the projection and the film, you know, in the theaters that, that couldn't afford that type of projector. Right. We talked about with B horror films that like, um, a lot of, um, one of the things that kind of helped the rise of it was the smaller, um, you know, theaters that at the time were owned by production companies, um, you know, losing money. So they couldn't afford like the really expensive, uh, films, that also, which I didn't even think about when we were talking about it, would mean that they don't have the capabilities to to have the latest, greatest, you know, hardware to, to for whatever, you know, to watch the film or, or whatever. So, you know, there was 
it was interesting to me and I watched the color version. I, I didn't see an option for black and white, but like, I wonder if it was like the exact same or, or how it worked. I, I don't know that piece of it, but it was just kind of, there was just, I felt like it was like so many layers to like the, like kind of the innovation with the technicolor that made me like eventually just stop. Cause I was like, I could sit here and what if this whole thing, mm-hmm. But it's just like, Jesus, they, they really did have to put a ton of more. They've had to put more thought into it than just throwing together sloppy, you know, horror film. And maybe that's one of the reasons why that jokester made it through to the end was because they're more worried about, like, uh, even being able to, like, sell this to watch in, in certain theaters. So. Uh, so something I was really curious about, and I couldn't find anything either confirming or denying this, but... I wondered when I read that it was one of the early Technicolor movies and then the, the thing about them doing it, shooting it both ways, like, was this an experiment? Was this them saying like, this is a low budget thing anyway, like throw the new cameras up there and see how it comes out. Cause Mm -hmm. we're not going to invest a lot of it. So let's just get our mistakes out of the way. And if it's good enough, we'll release it that way. And if not, we've got the black and white one to fall back on, but we're not going to bet a, $2 $2 million budget movie on our ability to get this right on the first try. And you know, here's the thing. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I didn't see anything like that. I don't know if I was actually searching, but I didn't, I don't remember seeing anything of it like that, but you know, how much more of the budget did it cost to do that too? Like what was the chance that the studio took to, to get that done? You know, because you think about it, like, that's part of the film budget in itself. And it's like, I know for a fact film had to be expensive back then. And, um, maybe that's why they had the jokester actually, they couldn't afford better, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, even how they filmed it. If it was literally just like two cameras or like, or what, but, um, yeah, it's, it definitely kind of gets you thinking and it's done in 1930s. Like that's the other, right. Like, holy shit. Like film wasn't hadn't been around that long, you know. I think it had been around less time than I've been alive, technically. You know, but <laughs> yeah, it's just crazy to think about. It's wild, mm-hmm. but just from a purely B movie perspective, I feel like this one has a lot of like not super obvious similarities to The Mask of Fu Manchu, in that from the very beginning you're just kind of like right in the story without a lot of character development or background it's almost immediately talking about something suspicious going on at the morgue. And there's a reporter who's convinced it was another murder by the moon killer. Mm -hmm. And then there's an autopsy and the guy calls it cannibalism. And he talks about strangulation and an incision from a strange surgical device. So basically in the first like five to 10 minutes, they've already established that we've got this serial killer on the loose called the moon killer who has a mode of operating during the full moon and has some sort of like surgical, expertise as well as an urge for cannibalism (laughs) and so and then they start talking about like the psychology of a serial killer and how an individual can seem perfectly sane and rational the rest of the time but when presented with the thing that initially drove them mad they lose all control so then it almost immediately goes into dr x begging the cops not to make it public that it could be a medical student and you know saying you know can you just give me some time and he's like all right you got 48 hours so the whole movie is like excitement, danger, time limit, (laughs) which I feel like was also exactly the formula from Mask of Fu Manchu, where in the beginning it's, okay, we're in this race against this crazy madman who is going to use the powers from this archaeological discovery to take over the world, or at least the white part of it. And so it was funny to me just from like a, a way of like managing the pace or managing the intensity of the movie. It felt like almost a carbon copy in the very beginning. Yeah, they um, time limits were definitely like on top of people. Like that was the thing yes, that was thinking right. about the most of the thirties. Like that's that's it's two out of two for sure. And also like like I feel like we can relate to it's like you have this unnecessary deadline that you're given and you're like, wait, why do I have forty eight hours? Well, that's all we can afford. It's like no, you definitely can afford more. Like we don't know when they're gonna anyway time limit for sure they almost should have like a little alarm in the top right 
like showing like like how much time you have <laughs> like left, you know, like the countdown from twenty four. Yeah, because he even came up like towards the end of the film, he's like, "It hasn't been forty eight hours yet." And it's like, "Whoa, it hasn't been forty eight hours yet." This is crazy. But um, there's been a lot going on. Yeah, it's like, but that journalist has a police badge, looking thing somehow. Yeah, he's serious, but we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do. Yeah, and it was kind of interesting to me that it. So I guess this one maybe was like an influence on later movies, but it also felt like this one had a lot of tropes from haunted house movies. Mm. The way that they were all, he brought all the people together and they were basically locked in his house uh, during a dark and stormy time. And you kind of get introduced to the different characters and then they're moving around in the house and, you're trying to figure out like who's the killer. And I don't know, there was just something about it that I was like, I feel like I've seen this setup in a million movies, but this is probably like the earliest example. Yeah, I think so. I can see the ghost story elements to it. And I wonder if that's like from storytelling, um, you know, I, I feel like storytelling was probably more relevant back then than it is now. Like, Hey, let me tell you a ghost story was, probably legit yep. scary back then. And so like there, we have more time with, with horror than what they did. And so what was their horror that they had? And we learned during hundred years or, you know, technically started 19, whatever. Or was it 18? Anyway, it started a long time ago. They didn't have very much. So what did they have? Ghost stories, maybe, you know, like, so, mm-hmm. Maybe that's maybe that's one of the reasons for um, I there were definitely more horror scenes in this one than I expected, but I can see the haunted house ghost type story throughout this whole thing. Like this whole story felt like it could have been just a ghost story, you know, like a story you tell around the campfire almost. Yeah, and there was the one scene where the reporter was searching around the doctor's house at night and then like his flashlights going out and you see that hand slowly reach out for him from the shadows. And then he turns around just in time and it like pulls back. That I feel like is a scene that's been copied a thousand times over Mm -hmm. in horror movies. And so there were just a lot of things in it where it felt like, man, this really, it almost feels like some of the ways that it's setting up these scenes are like cliche but it's like this, to your point, was definitely happening before that was the case. So just from, you know, it's easy to say like, oh, yeah, it's just a B movie. It doesn't matter. It's like, OK, cool. But it, it was doing some pretty legit next level horroring <laughs> in a few of the right. scenes, you know. It was also interesting to me uh, just thinking about them kind of like hovering around these topics that were sort of in the air that were culturally creepy at the time is it was for some reason, like the wax statues of the victims in the background during the test really mm-hmm. stood out to me. And I was like, weren't there, weren't there like a wax movie around this time or something? Mm-hmm. So I looked it up in 1933 was mystery of the wax museum with Lionel Atwill and Fay Ray again. <laughs> and then in 1936 was midnight at the wax museum and then in 1940 was Charlie Chan at the Wax Museum. <laughs> so I don't know if it's just because those were starting to be like a relatively new thing that people knew about. And so it was easy to say to take it that one step further because they're naturally creepy and be like, what if it was actually like malicious or something? So I don't know. I just this movie to me feels very entrenched in its time and place, much like the Mask of Fu Manchu was in sort of the way that it was tapping into cultural anxiety about things or fascination with things. Yeah, I think, I mean, it definitely has to like reflect on the anxieties of the time period for sure. I mean, I think like this, the paranoia of it, like, like you, you actually mentioned it in last week about, um, you know, post world war one, we're getting to world war two kind of during this time and in a way, but, the the effects of like the great war world war one like ha- had to have on on just like every nation but like can you trust this person like they 
came here from insert whatever bad country um, to, to find a new, new life. And can you trust them? Are they going back? Like, I don't know. There was just, there had to be so much paranoia back then. Uh, This is even pre cold war. So like, um, you know, where I feel like, you know, pre, you know, the cold war was just straight up paranoia just only, but there had to be some sort of that, like, can you trust your neighbor and of sorts because of the wartime? And so I think that like the anxieties of the time period is just that, like, who can you trust in life in general? And that might be why this one kind of worked out a little bit, but um, well, the whole movie is centered around that. Cause I mean, yeah. it, the, the idea that, you know, somebody could be walking around perfectly rationally until they get triggered by whatever mm-hmm. makes them crazy. And the fact that Dr. X was also restraining himself and giving himself the same tests as everyone else. It's just like, Oh, he like, we have to operate on the assumption that literally anybody in this house could be the bad guy. Mm-hmm. And I have to admit, I was not like super into this movie mm. for most of it until the part where the full moon comes out again, two nights after the last one, which makes total sense, but we'll look past that. And Wells just goes ape shit. And he puts on that fake hand and then he's turning on that experiment and shocking himself and starts covering himself in the synthetic flesh and then sneaks into the experiment room and kills Otto and then goes on to attack Joanne. And just in that moment where you realize the doctors handcuffed everyone they should have except the one person they should have. Mm hmm. And yeah. just that feeling of dread of like, oh, Dr. X is about to watch his own daughter get murdered by like the monster that they've all been trying to root out and have been terrified of the whole movie. Like that was so intense. And then I didn't see the the twist coming where Lee comes out of the background having pretended to be one of the wax figures. And then he fights Wells and ends up throwing the lantern at him and kicking him out the window like that whole sequence I thought was really good and just such a good plot twist and culmination of all the stuff the movie had kind of been like slowly building towards the whole time. Yeah. And so I thought that it had a much better ending than it had a rest of the movie. And I like that because it didn't feel, I don't know. It it felt a lot more intense when it came to like horror than most of the rest of the movie did. Yeah. So this yeah so he puts on the hand and then he starts putting on the th- synthetic skin and the, that's which was which was n- like intense in itself like just putting yeah. on the the skin and like the transformation that he did it's almost like the equivalent to like wolfman like transforming like on camera in, in my opinion but yeah and he looks so creepy mm-hmm. oh. like i can't really even explain why it wasn't like he was like a specific monster or anything he yeah. was just creepy as hell yeah, I mean, I I think it's like like just the concept of what he was doing. Like he was putting yeah. like straight up paste on his head, and then like it molded and you know shocked himself into into becoming the monster. Um, but so he does that. He comes out to choke. What was her name, Joanne? Yeah. On 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 the table, and the second he comes out, the three guys that are handcuffed like all jump up and start like yelling about it. Yeah. And, and like, I, if, if our listeners hadn't watched this movie, like you should watch it just for that scene alone, because it was straight up. Like if you get like multiple dogs together on like a leash and then they start barking <laughs> at like the neighbor, because it like, they all just jumped up and started yelling, but they couldn't do anything about it. And they weren't saying, uh, I didn't make out any words that they were saying initially. It literally sounded like they were barking. And I started like kind of chuckling because I was like, what the fuck? Like what's happening with this film thinking that like somehow they started like turning into an animal or whatever. And I was like, no, they were (laughs) literally just all yelling at the same time. Just basically like yelling like loud noises and not getting anything (laughs) accomplished. But, uh, but that sequence itself from the hand being put on to the, to him getting, you know, thrown out the window, a plus, like, I, I love, like, I thought it was great. I think 
the action in it is a little little bad you know like oh the choreograph uh, of the fighting was terrible but yeah yeah, yeah like <laughs> choking was like on the chest and it's like hey just because they got your hand on your throat doesn't mean you're like all of a sudden done um and the hands were creepy like the yeah i mean like it checked like multiple boxes for sure as far as horror goes that scene itself um and it was also one of those that we've talked about in a lot of other horror movies we've reviewed where there's that part where the protagonists think that they've turned the tide and that they're really in control. And then all of a sudden there's that moment in the movie where you realize very rapidly that they're not. And then you watch them realizing that too. Yeah. And there's something about it that just makes your stomach sink a little bit where it's like, Oh no, they're really doomed. Like the guys that we think are the good guys that are obviously going to win are about to get in a lot of trouble and they're not in control of the situation. They didn't actually know what was going on and all these plans and confidence they had are funny now. Mm -hmm. Like that's cute. You thought that was going to work. And this was like such a distilled example of that in that scene. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it, it, and then they had it in with some bullshit, but still like that scene specific, like that whole sequence is, it, it was top, top notch. Yeah. Totally pulled me in. I was on like the edge of my seat for it. I was just like, Oh wow, this yeah. is getting really interesting all of a sudden. And it paid off. Yeah. So yeah, I liked it. I mean, it's not, I don't know if it's one that I would be in a hurry to rewatch because I mean, even beyond Lee, the reporter, Mamie's character was also pretty, cringy and i just i think this one is worth watching once because of that twist at the end and i think it's a really good example of kind of i'm feeling like a lot of these early movies really feel like mashups of a lot of different stuff and that's just kind of characteristic of what we're going to get from these early b movies and that makes them interesting and this one's still kind of delivered on the horror at the end too so all in all worth doing yeah, and you know, like I was saying, uh, or and what we talked about, like part of the thing with B movies is the is the mashup of of genres. You know, having hu- hu- uh, comedy with horror, or you know, just just whatever. So like they they were doing it um, before B movies was even like a, a word, you know, or a thing. So right. um, you gotta give them credit there. And it's it's you know, at the end of the day, you're out an hour. And not the five hours that you were watching Under the Skin. And so, you know, it's like, you know, throw it on on a rainy day and it might it might be good. Good situation. That's I was watching this when it was like storming here in Oklahoma. Like we had the um, we had a really bad storm come through. And so, like, it it hit the mark for me as well as nighttime. So, like, I think. Oh, yeah. That's why the environment, my environment kind of helped me, um, help me with it. But then also like I can watch, sit down and watch a movie and, and actually be able to focus knowing it's like, Oh, it's only like an hour and 15 minutes long. Like, I can do this. Like, this is, it's like, it. once it gets to like hour, hour 30, I'm just like, I don't know anymore <laughs> Yeah, at <laughs> the time. But, um, yeah, it's worth, worth at least one watch. I don't think it's like a Halloween horror that I would throw on every October, um, but I think that they did and had more horror uh, elements to it than than I definitely expected. And also, like, one of the main points I just want to make for this whole episode is uh, we were just as screwed up in the 30s as we are now. Yeah, no, no doubt. Oh, the last thing is, like, the Moon Killer, that's a, that's a dope name, man. Like, if I was a serial killer, I would want something like that. Yeah, and I think we, we're we starting to develop some of those things that we want to pay attention to week to week. So yeah. one of them is definitely the, you know, throwing you right in to the exciting beginning to try and get you hooked. And then another is paying attention to how these end. So we've got two in a row with happy endings, which I don't think is always going to be the case with the horror movies. So stuff to track. I'm excited about it. The 30s have shown themselves well. And next week, we'll be back with our first movie of the 1940s. And that's it for today's episode. If you've listened this far, then thank you, and we hope you've enjoyed it. We're always looking for new ideas, so if you have any questions, comments, or movie suggestions, please send us an email at thehorrificpod at gmail.com. 
or hit us up on the IG. That's what the kids call Instagram. Just search for The Horrific Podcast. Thanks for listening. I got a question for you before we end. All right, uh, because you glossed over how dope the name the Moon Killer is, uh, what uh, name would you have if you were a killer? I would make it something kind of ridiculous, like the Muffins Killer, <laughs> like something that you just could not take seriously. Oven mitt, the oven mitt Strangler. <laughs> well, yeah, like like nobody's gonna hear it and be like, "Oh, I actually have to care about that threat." It's like the chocolate chip muffin killer struck again. Yeah. And everybody's like, well, that wouldn't be so bad if I got a muffin out of it. Like you don't want them to take you seriously. If you want to have longevity, I think the mesquite barbecue sauce strangler <laughs> is back at it again. It's like, why do you have to add mesquite to it? It's a good flavor. <laughs> the phantom tickler. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mine would probably be Joe or Russell my mortal in- enemies like i would i would make sure that they they thought i was them to bring them down oh yeah if i could frame anyone it would be patrick mahomes that guy's gonna ruin my life for another decade mm. it's That's hard good. to be a raiders fan oh what if something happens to him now now we're gonna be investigated my name well, if he starts killing people you could call me you could call me vinegar barbecue sauce killer. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be the two copies of terror firmer killer. <laughs> the one nut singer. That's what I want to be called. <laughs> That's how I already am on the FBI list. Yeah. <laughs>